Because it goes back to what you said about service. Yeah. I now get to know that I bring these two women that are so awesome water up until pandemic every week. Yep. You know, you're making people feel good. And here's the beautiful turnaround as if I'm having a shitty day and I come in and I bring you water and you're sharing in my story and you tell me something, it's turning around and then you look at me and say, hey, thank you for the water. You know, Gregory bought the water. You then acknowledge me. How am I not going to feel better? It's such a simple thing and we don't get, you know, if I'm in a shitty mood and I'm going to call you and ask you how you are, I then quit thinking about me. I then get wrapped up into you. And it's not, when I say manipulated, the, the Phil W and all his friends, it's, I'm going to be, ah, that just moved me. I'm going to ask you how you are. You're going to tell me, but after that, you're going <laughs> to right. do something in turn. Right. So how, what, what a beautiful thing. Yeah. I just... Welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com. We're first and foremost, we're Magazine Hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself or a loved one, maybe you're actively in recovery a little while or a long, long time, you can find all kinds of topics and information. I'm really living a happy, successful, and sober life here at Recovery Today. My name is Rob Hanley. I'm the editor-in-chief of Recovery Today. And as usual, I'm joined by a guest I'm really, really excited about. He's an actor, he's a model, and he's a lifestyle expert. Love that, the lifestyle expert part. We're going to get into that. He's currently uh, has a recurring role on the most uh, recent third season of the hit HBO series, Westworld. Love Westworld. He's recently been nominated for a Daytime Emmy Award in the category of Outstanding Performance by a Supporting Actor in Digital Drama for his role in the Emmy-winning web series, Venice the Series. He's been in hundreds and hundreds of TV commercials and other shows like Days of Our Lives, General Hospital. He's guest starred in Entourage, Love Entourage, Criminal Minds, Bones, Castle, a whole bunch of other stuff. And he is in the SAG independent feature film, of which I've seen the trailer. It's called 86 Melrose. It's probably going to be released right about the time that you guys are seeing this uh, interview here, and it is badass. Last but certainly not least, 15 years of sobriety. Welcome, Gregory Sarian. Thanks for jumping on, man. Thank, thank you for bringing me in. Okay, that was great. Could we? Could you call me every day and just do that? That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, That's absolutely, great. man. So I get. Um, I, and by the way, as I was just saying, kind of before we started the record button here, you know, my favorite part of this is is kind of the pre-interview stuff. So it's cool, really cool to meet you. Um, for me, the first thing, I'm just one of these elephants in the room people, I have to kind of address the elephant in the room. And that is really a, a cool, you know, impressive uh, CV or bio that I went through. But I have to ask, what is a lifestyle expert, man? I, I, I like that. So I wanted to see where that led, a lifestyle expert. Um, I, I, a lifestyle expert. Uh, for me, when you think about it in the business, in the world of, modeling, acting, TV, and film. Um, a lifestyle expert is somebody that can share with you lifestyle antidotes, lifestyle choices. Uh, because I've modeled for 25 years, I have an idea as to what may look good, what may not look good. Um, in regards to, there was a moment in my career where I wasn't doing as much work as I wanted to, so I became a motivational speaker. Okay. And in the realm of my speaking, uh, my platform was all about fear. Like, what are you afraid of? You know, and the crux of all of that was we are so afraid of not to, to take a step forward or to go into an audition or meet somebody for the first time. It's not that we're afraid of that. We're afraid of what most people think, you know? So mm -hmm. I then volleyed that into, um, I host a health and wellness show and it's all about health and wellness and all about, you know, eight to 10 glasses of water a day is great for your, um, your body. Um, our mom passed away 20 years ago from esophageal cancer. And one of the signs and symptoms of that is not being able to swallow. So I have taken all of that. And when I'm presented with an opportunity, 
what do you do? I'm a lifestyle expert. And here's what's really great about all of that. Um, as we spoke in the beginning, I have an identical twin. His name is Lawrence. And Lawrence, as well as a lifestyle expert, but he used to be known as the fashion guy. So as I, in the very beginning of my career, was booking most of the work, the acting, the modeling and stuff, just because it's how it was playing itself out, he started doing something that he was really good at, talking about fashion. And then 20 years later, he is one of the most sought after fashion experts in the business. And he's on Hallmark's Home and Family. And so he speaks in regards to that. A couple of years ago, we were then brought together to be Rachel Ray's twins, the makeover twins. So as he's talking about the fashion, I'm talking about the inside. And together we make people over. And I start off every makeover is, tell me your story. Who are you? And it's never the first answer. It's the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth answer as to who somebody is. That's how I'm a lifestyle. I love that, man. I love that. You're going to be like an easy, really super easy interview. Uh, and and we're going to get a lot of stuff out because we're on the same page exactly. Like I always tell people, usually the best parts kind of come later after we get to know uh, each other a little bit and kind of get the, the, the vibe, if you will, of, of the conversation. But you led me right into the first question, which is usually my first question is, you know, tell us a little about your story beyond that. I did not know any of the Rachel Ray stuff. In fact, I didn't even know that you had a twin brother. I, I like spaced that completely. So, but the one part I want to make sure that you hit on is the part about being discovered because it's so Hollywood movie-ish. So t tell us your story, man. Uh, working, I was um, in college and I was a former jock, uh, runner, uh, and I was working at a department store. And here's, what, and here's one, one thing that I'm grateful for about my parents is uh, my, both of my parents were immigrants. So my dad came from Armenia. My mom was born in Berlin, Germany. And, you know, like my father survived war-torn Middle East. My mother, our grandfather, was drafted into the Nazi party. He told the Nazis to F off. And, you know, when people hear of Germans and the Nazi party, they just assume, but not every German became part of the regime. So my grandfather, who is one of my heroes, basically told him to kiss his ass and... They went to Poland for a couple of years, so my mom survived that war. Wow. So two immigrants come to this country. They brought us up to be guests in this country. So we were taught to respect the country we live in, and they taught us to be gentlemen. And if we weren't gentlemen, we'd be given a look, we'd be given a conversation, because that's what we do. We are men, yeah. Yeah. and you show up as a gentleman. And um, when I worked at this department store, I treated everybody like the same and everybody's story meant something to me. And, you know, I, I would cruise all over the department store and become a personal shopper. And at this one moment on this one day, um, I was helping this gentleman um, pick out outfits. And I never believe in saying to somebody that looks good when it doesn't, I'd say, let's find other options. Let's create something different. And I would be really transparent. I'd say, you know, you're wearing jeans that cut you off. And your gut is spilling over. And I'm sure that's not the look what you're looking for. So let's find something where you feel better. And, and, you know, back to when Lawrence and I do makeovers, it's, we can all look great. How do you feel? You know, when somebody looks great, but doesn't feel great when they walk into a room, we all look at that. But if somebody feels great in what they're wearing, this energy just bounces off who they are. So, uh, I was helping, his name was Tom Racina. He was one of the head writers for Days of Our Lives. Um, and during the crux of me being his helper that day, he said, uh, are you an actor? And I went, of course I am. And, uh, <laughs> next thing I knew, I was thrown on Days of Our Lives. And so uh, you actually, were you actually, the part of the reason I'm laughing and I'm wondering like, was that really true or not? Or was it like, yeah, I could be or what? You know, uh, I, you know, I really say yes a lot. So I'm like, why not? Like, you write a soap opera and you want to, like, you want me to send you a photo? Of course I like, that would be ridiculous. Like, you're going to ask, so, uh, and next thing, and I had the big feathered hair and, you know, uh, and here, I was on American Bandstand for five years, so I had come oh, off okay. on that for a couple of years and I thought, why the hell not? And um, next thing I knew, I was on Days of Our Lives and... 
you know, I, it was everything and anything you think it would be. Yeah. Way back then. And, you know, my first day I had a couple of words and I'm thrown into hair and makeup and people are nice and kind. And next thing I know is I'm in a sound booth waiting for Deidre Hall, who's daytime royalty doctor. And she's a friend of mine now. And I still look at her like, hi, you're, and she's a twin. So it's this connectivity and, you know, you're a kid and you're thrown on a soap opera and you're being paid to say words. And it was um, magical, but it, it wasn't because I didn't take it the way I possibly could have. I was in my early 20s, 23. And um, I was more about the lights, camera, action than I was, let me tell a great story. And it uh, was a very big defining moment for me that I was given a great gift and don't mess with a great gift. You know, the challenge, I think, a little bit is to recognize the fact that you actually have a gift. You know, it's the whole thing about you lose your family, you lose your loved one or whatever. You, it's the whole, like, you know, you didn't realize what you had until you lost it. I have to ask, though, before I go further on this, because I don't think we've interviewed anybody that has had as much experience in soap operas. And as, you're, as we're, I'm thinking about a 23-year-old, I'm thinking about in that context, and it's every day. So it's oh like, God. like, do you get a, you get a script oh on God. Tuesday and then on Wednesday you're shooting? Is that actually how it works? No, you're given a script on a Sunday. And here's what was really cool. I was still living uh, with my dad and NBC delivered a script. And my, here's my thing. My dad, again, was an immigrant. And he watched his, his first me, then his twins dance on American Bandstand. He loved Dick Clark, but he didn't get it because he became a very, very like huge politician and a businessman. And if you go to work nine to five every day and you walk into an office, it's substantial. But if you go to an audition, go to an audition, go to it, it's a pipe dream to him. Yeah. And to have a script come to his house, to come to, to, come to the mayor's house for his son. Wow. Like, oh, let me look at that. And it was a lot of dialogue and I wasn't, you know what, Rob, I just wasn't ready. And it was boom and boom and boom. And, you know, I'll say this for me. I did rehearse. I did practice. I did study my lines. I was never not memorized. Um, the girl that's on the show now her name's, that still plays the part, her name's Jennifer. Her name's Missy Brennan. She was, um, and actually Jennifer Aniston's dad, um, John Aniston, became great acquaintances with me. He kind of took me under his wing because I walked in, I'm like, hi, I don't know anybody. Um, so you build these little worlds and these little families and these pods of people that you work with and they were all really, really great to me. And Emma Sams was a friend of mine and she was on Dynasty at the time. And we ran lines, I just didn't take it, a, I didn't take it a step further. And um, you know, you, you hope for the best and back then you, ran your lines, you did a rehearsal, you did hair and makeup, you did a clothing check, and then you were allowed to make mistakes. Now, because everything is streaming online, digital web, on your phone, on your iPad, time is money. So you don't have the opportunity to rehearse the way you used to. Oh, wow. So now when you get to a job, your first take has got to be balls out. So it's just it's just a different day in life. And but yeah, is it is it a little bit then of improv improvisation or the fact that you're you you're kind of nimble on your feet that it's the vibe of what the scene was or do they go no 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 cut cut that shit like how does that if they work? hate what you're doing it's cut that shit yeah and thank you for saying good I'm glad I can say the word shit cut that shit <laughs> um, I'm trying really hard to not use some of my other words um, you know. Time is money now. So, you know, what was really great, as you said about Venice, is, you know, when somebody sits down and writes something, they put their heart onto the paper and it is my job to then tell their story in regard, in, with, with the best interpretation I can. Um, there are some productions and some shows that if you miss a period, you know, I was in Germany working on Counterpart and I added one, ah, and, I, and we're talking counterpart in this huge warehouse in Berlin, Germany. And the script supervisor said, can't do it. 
you know, you have to hit every period, every comma. And then there's other things like Venice, the series. She, the creator, Kristen, she was directing me, Krista Chappelle. She allowed me to add an and or a the or something that really made sense. And if it didn't, of course, it's her show. Stop Right, it. right, right, right. But if they, you know, and here's, it's all collaborative and it's all a team and it's never personal. If somebody wrote a script and you stick by the script, you know that. And that's, as an actor, I now go up to productions and I say, hey, are we word for word, period for period, if I add an and or a the or something, am I getting my head cut off? And um, I also go up to um, the director and I say, please tell me what you're looking for. What do you want? Um, Does everybody do that kind of thing, by the way? Pardon? Does everybody do that kind of thing? Like at your level, do they do that kind of thing? I do. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, you know, I, uh, I've been on great commercials. I've been on great sets where somebody that I just met is my wife. And I'm like, let's talk to the director. And I just want to know how handsy do you want us? Do you want the affectation? Do you want the flirty? Do you want, are we the basic couple or are we the loving couple? Because once we start filming, I'd rather have that little bit done. Yeah. Like I want to know if I'm loving on you, then I'm going to give you that. And every take is different, but I just want to know, give me that little bit of a roadmap just so I know that when you say Gregory action, I know exactly what I'm doing. That's really, really interesting. I, uh, I, I haven't had the opportunity really to ask that many questions with this, the you know, number of, we were talking about grateful for so many actors that we, that we featured, influencers. I haven't really asked that, that had the opportunity, I think, to ask that many questions. I appreciate kind of a look behind it because I'm always curious to know, like, how does that work? But it's, um, and I, obviously, as you get better and better and better at your skill. You know, what, well, here's what I'll say is, of course, you know Donna Mills. Yeah. And I was fortunate to meet Donna Mills on Nip Tuck. I had a guest star with my twin Lawrence on Nip Tuck. And we, be, we have become family. And she is... I love Nip. Nip Tuck was great. Love that show. Season five, we're the Berkowitz twins. And it was with 80 superstars. We're talking Donna Mills, Joan Van Ark, Deborah Shelton, Sherry Belafonte, Harper. And it was like with 80s... 80 soap opera royalty. It was pretty phenomenal. But we, as we become friends, she was on General Hospital and I asked her once, I said, what's the one thing that you miss the most? And she said, I miss the rehearsing because the speed is so different. She goes, I'm not landing. We would run and rehearse a take four or five times. It wasn't that we didn't know our character because she played, she goes, I played Abby for 14 years. Yeah. She said, but you know, picking up a coffee cup turns into something different. It's, and the feeling and the back and forth, you know, every time you do something with an actor, it's another, it's another tennis serve. Sometimes it goes into the net. Sometimes you have a great volley. Sometimes they hit it so hard you can see the ball fly past you. Hmm. So it's always different, always new. And when it's boom, let's go, you've got to again, show up on point and being, be delivered, be ready to serve. There's things that I've done in the past couple of years, one take done and boom and done. Like, Do you ever, um, uh, and this is maybe a little bit to the addict mind or, you know, I'm a believer that everybody's got, everybody's got you know, mental health issues, but do you ever, maybe it's just- you, <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I, 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 know, I, I, but I believe, I believe we're all, I believe we're all on a Ferris wheel in our mind. And I believe that there's a circus and, I've said, I say that I'm crazy and I don't say, say it lightly, but I believe we all have a bit of crazy. I believe we all have that mind. So I think you. the ones that are really crazy are the ones that you'd say, we're all crazy. And they're like, I'm not crazy. And it's like, actually, you're the fucking craziest one of all, actually. The fact that you don't know you're crazy means you're actually crazy. You're actually more crazy. Because you could have just killed me and I just dodged that bullet. <laughs> and here's, can I say one? Here's what I... And then we're going to talk about sobriety, but yeah. here's a beautiful part of sobriety. If I looked at you and said, Rob, you're crazy. You're not going to bump, jump off of this and call Matt and be like, I'm never talking to him, man. And you're like, yeah, I am. And how great to identify that we're all yeah. up. Yeah. And it's not a bad thing. It's a human thing. And it's us just being the best that we can at every given moment. And it's, Good, bad, and different. Yeah, and actually being real, you know, I really, I don't like a lot of pretense. 
And it's funny because there's a balance between being highly skilled and being professional and things like that, the kind of the marks, I guess, in your mindset that you, that, that the things that you must hit and at the same time, really connecting. I think that's really the, that's, you know, what I enjoy the most about, but the question I wanted to ask for kind of in regard to mental health is, and maybe this is just a human question is, do you ever feel like with all of these things and you're talking about picking up a coffee cup and the interaction, the volley back and forth, do you ever feel like, fuck, what if I, what if the, what if the well runs dry? Like, what if I don't have it anymore? You know, do you ever, do you ever do that? I do a lot of writing, for example, and, and I like to think that I'm good at it. I enjoy it. I like when I'm done with it, but it's difficult. A lot of times I'll approach things and it's always in this back, this chatter in the back of your mind thinking like, I wonder if I still have it, you know? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for saying that. And thank you for, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are so afraid to be seen. And what I love about our few moments together is that you are just sharing you. And it's just nice because I, we've already connected. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Totally, man. So it's, it's um, I appreciate sharing that. You know, there's moments, there's, yeah, there's moments where I just don't have it. There's moments where I want to do something different. There are moments where I'm like, I'm done. I, I you know, I, I was talking to my trainer yesterday, physical therapist, and he's a writer and he's an actor. And like, we're done. Like, today I'm tired, you know, and I didn't have it in me. And he goes, you know, Monday, wake up Thursday morning and get 10 more no's. And I'm like, I don't know if I want 10 more no's. You know, I'm, and, and the truth is, and here's the, here's the, like, I'm Emmy nominated now. Yeah, I, I don't really need to get a no, actually, either, you know. Get a no. Yeah. Uh, I'm still going to get no's. And, <laughs> you know, I'm still going to have a moment where, I like, you know, I, I, you know, and let me, let me throw this out there too, as I believe that in regards to that crazy, it's, you know, we wear our hearts on our sleeve. We are open books. We are so, you know, I have 15 years of sobriety and it is my heart on my sleeve, an open book, and there's a vulnerability behind it. So I, I believe that, you know, even, being sober, like give me an extra hour every day because that's just one more thing. And I wouldn't change it for the world because it's, you know, we're storytellers. Yeah. I'm a storyteller. You know, you bring out stories, you share stories, you tell stories. So part of my story is that today I'm going to be tired. Tomorrow I'm not going to be tired. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. There's moments where I'm like, as you said, fuck it. I don't have it today. And yeah. that's okay. Because if I was just dialing it in, why would you want to watch my story? Yeah, I just, I, I it's funny. I, uh, I've got a couple of kids. <clears throat> I've got an 18 year old boy and a, and a 16 year old girl. And my passion is to learn things and then to transfer information. And it's kind of, we we're talking pre, I, I like to connect stuff. Sure. And so uh, the, the, one of the things about nice about, about being a parent is you have a captive audience. So I've told my kids and I told my daughter most recently, she's really into personal development and she's doing all these really cool, extraordinary things. And, and I was, I told her before, I said, the one thing that the world will not tolerate more than anything, it doesn't matter what culture, what religion, what political, anything at all. There's only one thing they hate. Uh, the, the cardinal sin above all things is hypocrisy. And so it, it's synergistic with fakeness and things like that. And there's a balance between, you know, standing bare naked in front of somebody in your holy underwear or something like that, or your, you know, all your warts, as they say, and at the same time, not having pretense. I, I don't know, just it's kind of where I kind of am right now. So I, I like, I like all that. I have to ask this because you said, I love that, I said that, but I love that you said that because I want to throw one thing out there when I was single and I used to date, I would be pretty transparent and it turned off people that I was dating uh -huh. and I would say why and they say well it's too much too soon and my thought was I don't have time to remember what I did or didn't say or create and here's the truth anything you want to find out about me you can google yeah like, I'm not going to know my favorite color but it's it's not that big of a deal and I I I love that I live that way because you know you get an exchange with one person it may be one but if you and I just have this one exchange 
you will walk away having an idea of who I am and knowing me. Same thing with you and how great yeah. is then that's an experience. Yeah, we totally, having, man. We are having an experience and I would rather be in my holy underwear with the quote unquote warts and have you get to know me than be in this beautiful three piece, three piece Hugo yeah. Boss suit. And don't get me wrong, I love a Hugo Boss suit um, and have no idea who I am. Yeah. I, I, I actually, you hit it exactly for me too. I feel exactly the same way. Love a Hugo Boss suit and, and all this stuff. And, but at the, at the, I think that we all, what we all really crave is connection, which is so cool as part of one of the things that they're discovering now with addiction, depression. Um, I'm a, uh, uh, we've had a guy, a real cool guy. If you haven't seen him, his name is Johan Hari. He's got a bazillion views of TED Talks and he talks about um, connection and purpose being the fundamental things um, really for, um, uh, um, probably happiness, but he means like of recovery or sure. the opposite of getting into addiction. And so it's actually kind of sad in the middle of this freaking pandemic that we're on that we're, we're not connected and that we're afraid of each other. But before I go down that road, and I do want to go down the Rona, the Rona road, I have to ask this, because um, you said it kind of in the opening part, and it struck me uh, really significantly, and nobody talks about it. Uh, what does it mean to be a gentleman? Because it is obvious to me in your, how you look, it is obvious to me in your demeanor, in your interaction, but now you've mentioned it in little things, whether the interview or the pre-interview, I forget, talking about helping a lady, you know, walking a lady down to baggage claim. What does it mean to be a gentleman? It means saying thank you and please. It means stamp... I was, this is what I was taught. If a woman walked into the room and I didn't stand up, I'd get a look. It means if a woman walked in and I walked in front of her through an open door, my father would stop and say, we're going to do that again. Mm -hmm. It means, you know what a gentleman means? It means being kind. Yeah. It means, you know, I posted something on Facebook yesterday. <laughs> Excuse me. And it, um, we all have our own political views. We all have opinions. We all... I don't, I will not stand for a gentleman or anybody using derogatory words toward women. I believe boys, like I'm one of three boys. We fight, boys fight. You know, I don't, I don't believe in violence. However, it is not acceptable to me to say derogatory, horrible curse words to women. It's not who I am. It's not what you do. It's not the world I was brought up in. It, you know, a gentleman is, you know, some, you call somebody and you ask somebody for help on the phone, you ask them how they are. Yeah. A gentleman is being on a show, on a job. You know, it's cleaning up my dressing room, asking somebody, hey, can I get you something? It's a gentleman is walking into a meeting and walking to the elderly women or gentlemen and go, hey, can I get you coffee? Hey, do you drink water? Let me bring you water. Let me, do you need something? It's a being of service in a big, a gentleman is being of service. I like that. I like that a lot. I'm reminded of actually a movie I loved a whole lot, Brandon Frazier and Blast from the Past. Remember we went into the, the, the bunker and um, uh, Alicia Silverstone was, that, that's who it was. Uh, um, and she was explaining how, uh, you know, he lived, he was from a different time. And I, I resonate, we're, you're younger than I am, but very much I was raised the same way. You hold the door, you're kind, um, you, your word means something, um, these kind of things. And, and there's a little scene in the movie where she asked about why, man, why manners. And, he, and she had said something like, or maybe it wasn't somebody else in the movie. Like it wasn't actually her, somebody else. And they said, you show manners to people to show that you value them. Absolutely. Which is so cool, man. It's just simple. You know what it is? We just want to, you know, you were saying earlier about the gentleman that was talking about addiction and it's a connection. We just want to matter. Yeah. We just want to, you know, there was um, a big thing right now that came out in SAG and SAG Insurance. And apparently we were led to believe something and they were doing something over here. And my insurance is in jeopardy. And I called the union and I spoke to the health plan and this guy was on the phone and he was very abrupt with me. And at one point I said, how are you? And in the process of being abrupt with me, he goes, what do you mean? 
And I said, I'm sure that you are getting thousands of this same phone call. And I said, I'm sorry that it's landing on you. I hope you understand it's directed to the situation, not you. And he paused and he said, no one's asked me yet how I am. And I said, it sucks. It sucks to be you because you are just the messenger. How are you? And he opened up and <laughs> it didn't change my plan. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with where they we sometimes are. do change the plan though for you, man. You get in the you get into the little extra pile. It doesn't hurt. No, but I could you extend my month? Um, <laughs> you know, we all have an extra moment in our days, especially today, to say to somebody, "Thank you. How are you? Yeah. What can I do?" You know, I am. People break their ass. They break their ass. Yeah. The frontline workers, you know, the people that utilities on the street, all these. And where the fuck people have this entitlement to, especially today. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's not just the pandemic is over here. We're all going through a pandemic. We are all in this social uprising. Yep. And to me, it doesn't matter what color you are. It matters how you treat somebody. I was brought up to play in all the colors in the cram box. God, man, you know, that's very, um, it's not generally what I would expect from, um, I, I agree 100%. I really, for me, I don't, I really, I don't care. I, I, you know, I, I'm highly prejudiced to assholes. That's what I'm really highly prejudiced to. And um, nobody else, I really don't care what, where. I have empathy and sympathy for your situation for sure. And we'll do anything I can do to help out, but I'm just prejudiced to, to assholes. I don't, you know, I don't, it, 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 people that disrespect others or think that they're fucking entitled, man. I'm, you know, I don't want to go on a rant, but I know, but let's do it together. And if we have to continue this and have it be (laughs) our own thing about, we're going to teach you how to fucking be kind. I don't, you know, you know, here's, and this is, I unfriended someone yesterday because they went after a woman and it was political. Mm. Don't go after a woman. And here's the deal. I don't, you know, listen, I believe boys can fend for themselves, but if you, you know, I, I don't, I don't believe in entitlement. My father again came to this country and from the minute I was born, I was making my bed, polishing his shoes, sweeping the backyard, helping my mother. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And there's this level of, and maybe it goes back to what I was saying about what it means to be a gentleman. It's just about being of service. You and I are in a conversation of our lifetime now to be of service. Hi, how are you? What can I do? You know, just because Sergio's here and his service in my life is to clean my house, doesn't mean that I leave the kitchen a sloppy mess so he can- Hell no, it. man. I clean my kitchen before, like my yeah. bed's already made. You yeah, know? we're we're so much on the same page. That is just so it, much. I believe, I believe in my heart of hearts, if we were just kinder to one another, yeah. to say hello, to say thank you and please, because here's the truth. When you make a phone call, excuse me, you don't know what somebody's color is. You have yeah. no idea what their, their, their ethnicity is. There's a yeah. woman that I spoke to in regards to getting some stuff done on my car. And I said, are you okay today? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'm in LA, you're in New Jersey. You know, there's, a, there's an uprising in COVID with you. Are you all, are you wearing your mask? What's it like with the company? And I asked her one more question and she lost her shit. Her boyfriend just died because there was no mask mandate. And she was embarrassed and we spent 20 minutes. She took me off the conversation and I hung up with her and I thought, I love that I asked. Yeah. You know, you never know what, um, you never know what somebody is going through. And I I was thinking about, I I think I read in a book one time or somebody saying, you know, you're going to interact with the guy at the donut shop, at the airline, at wherever it might be. And you don't know, before they came to work, they might have had a gun in their mouth and thinking, this is fucking it. And, um, you know, I actually used to run, I used to do this as a, I haven't done it in a while. I haven't traveled that much in a while. But I used to ask people, um, you know, I'd, I'd say, 
and I, I'm a Christian, and, but I, I just want to connect with people. I don't really care. But I would say, I got a question for you. I would make a rule. I'd say, I'm going to ask three people this question. I made a little banter of it. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask three people. I told myself I was going to ask three people this question today. Can I ask you this question? I usually did it when they were alone. And they'd say, well, yeah, sure. And I'd say, has anybody told you that God loved you today? So, um, so, and that was part of the thinking about having a gun in your mouth. Because they might have said to themselves, if you're real, you better do some shit because I'm getting ready to end it right now. And then some knucklehead who's got a little personal goal to ask three people, has any, then, and they would say no. And I'd say, well, then, I, then I'm the first, then I make a joke out of it. So I'm the first one. And they'd say, well, okay, I guess so. so but you never knew what they were going through ahead of time. It's kind of my whole thing, just to sprinkle shit around a little bit. So I, don't, I was on a flight flying to New York and the stewardess, she was awful <laughs> awful and i remember saying how are you i'm fine and i remember she came up and i look and i said what's your name and she told me you and her name and i said i just want to say in advance thank you for taking care of me and it was a flight that i had to be that i happened to be in first and i was really grateful for that and she goes what and i said i'm probably going to be a pain in the ass over the nuts because i love warm nuts and i said and i'm probably going to ask for two diet cokes in advance thank you and in my mind we're hugging Changed everything for her. In your mind, that's important too. In my mind, we're hugging. Very well, cool. Because I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a creepy guy. Yeah, no, you I get know, it. That we, you know, but I asked. You know, my father used to say to me, "Gregory, you say hi to the Walking Dead," and I said, "Why not?" I said hi to everybody. Up, How are you? What's going on? Are you okay? Can I help you with this? Can I help you with that? Are we good? You know, I used to be a food server, and the busboy, I believe, is the unsung hero. And my father, it was, he was just, it was just a different time. And well, being a food server, you become best friends with the busboys. And every time he was missing something, I'd say, hey, you know, by his name, John, can you come over? Great, John would take care of us immediately. And it made the experience better. Sometimes you get in the weeds and you're really behind. That person back there, or anybody, or the hostess, will remember me because they yeah. said, how are you? What's your name? Hi, Susie. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're cut from the same cloth. I'll try one more out, or one more out and then I'm gonna, then I want to get into your addiction story because I really want to okay. get into, into that. I'm a chatter. I'm sorry. Your recovery story. No, this is really, really good. And uh, not, you know, not pressed for time, but I, there is one more I want to try out on you. Is yeah. lessons, lessons I teach my kids, I guess I would say, is I don't like when people go into a restaurant, whether it's fast food or whatever it is, and say, give me. And so from the time that my kids were very, very young, or I'll take, you never, first of all, it's always for me and how I've always trained is like, hi, hi, how are you today? Standard procedure to say, hi, how are you today? Always. But the next thing is when you're getting ready to order, it always starts with, I would like, not give me, I'll take, um, you know, I would like, or to the waiter, when you, excuse me, when you have a moment, not bring me some ketchup, when you have a moment, I would appreciate yada, yada, yada. Same thing, exactly, I mean, we went to the oh same Oh my thing. God, I don't, let me just say this. First of all, wait till they call you up. Don't rush that counter. You know, second of all, ask them how they are, and here's, here's, here's my story on human I'm on an airplane because I agree wholeheartedly because we need them more than they need us because yeah. they can stand there and wait for 30 minutes. Yeah. I was on a flight. It was packed to LA, Florida, and I was with a friend of mine, very, very abrupt. And she goes, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go to the front because I'd like to get in bulkhead. And she goes, no, 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 they're, they're witches. They're not going to let you do that. And I go, well, uh, okay. So I walk up and I wait and the flight is packed. Act. Mm -hmm. So I stand up there, they look up, and I walk up, and I wait till them to have them usher me up, and I go, thank you so much. And I said, I feel like I'm Charlie, and you're my angels. They smile, and I said, ladies, how are you? And one gets tear in her eyes, and I said, what happened? She said, I've been here since 6 a.m., and you're the nicest person. And I said, okay, thank you for that. What can I do? And I said, hold on. I ran over there, and I bought them chocolates, which was very random. Who but does that? I do. Yeah. You know, I've bought women that work at a gate lunch in Boston <laughs> because they had a shitty day and I had three hours and I could afford it at that moment. No, you, 
if you, I had been upgraded more times than not because I was kind. I said, thank you and please. I asked them how they were. And just wait till you get called up. And yes, that's may I please. Thank you so much. Yeah. I want, yeah. I want you to go away and you're still not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I didn't anticipate to have kind of an interview on the lessons of life, but it's good, man. What, well, but can I don't, say, they don't hear it enough. It makes it, it makes it kind of more, you know, most people bring me back for jobs. I want to believe because it's my talent. And I also know that I'm just a good guy. Like I'm a nice guy. Yeah, man. You know, yeah. If I'm going, if I'm having lunch with an entire team, and I'm going to throw away my plate. Am I that arrogant that I can't go, hey, let me take, Greg, we're fine. No, no, let me get it. Yeah. That's what you do. It comes around to this, it comes around to the whole thing as we go kind of into recovery, it comes around into the service, into, into being of service, right? So the whole idea that we are uh, doing something for someone else that we're in service it releases dopamine for us. It releases dopamine for them. And it also releases dopamine for anybody else. I mean, it makes us feel good in that we're contributing to be of service to other people. Well, when you do, you know, like an example, I have a commitment. I have the water yeah. commitment that I've had yeah. for years. Yeah. And I just don't bring the water to the speaker. I bring a bag of like five, six waters because there's two women yeah. that are elderly and I love them. I call one of them mom. And then the other one is, um, um, they're very, very, very famous. And it's not because of that. It's because here's the deal. When you sit in a room, we're all doing the same thing. I just have an affinity for people that tell great stories. And I'm like, Oh my God, I used to watch you on TV. This is awesome. Cause it goes back to what you said about service. Yeah. I now get to know that I bring these two women that are so awesome. Water up until pandemic every week yeah. you know you're making people feel good and here's the beautiful turnaround as if i'm having a shitty day and i come in and i bring you water and you're sharing in my story and you tell me something it's turning around and then you look at me and say hey thank you for the water you know gregory bought the water you then acknowledge me how am i not going to feel better it's such a simple thing and we don't get you know, if I'm in a shitty mood and I'm going to call you and ask you how you are, I then quit thinking about me. I then get wrapped up into you. Well, yeah, what, that's the whole what, thing, right? Like what I'm a manipulated dick. Like, and, yeah. it's, and it's not, when I say manipulated, the, the Bill W and all his friends, it's, I'm going to be, uh, that just moved me. I'm going to ask you how you are. You're going to tell me, but after that, you're going to, <laughs> right. Something in turn. Right. So how, what, what a beautiful thing. Yeah. I just, yeah, that's so cool. All right. So give me the nitty gritty. Give me some, tell me some revelatory, you know, mind blood. Give me the, like the, your, uh, your, when and how did you realize and what was your drug of choice? And let's get into some stuff like that, man. Like, let's get dirty. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you for, you know, here's, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about wearing your heart on your sleeve and just being moved by the beauty of this gift of just, you know, if everybody could just be of service in any way that looks like, right? Even when you walk out, if you, if every person opened the door for somebody else or said hello, the world would be different. Um, I, I believe that I was born out of the gate, um, an alcoholic drug addict. Um, my drug of choice to date was Marlboro Lights cigarettes. It was, um, it's... To date, it, today still? Oh, I, you, you know, I think that they all, yes, to date. If I, if, yeah. yeah, it was my thing. Um, couldn't get enough crystal meth in me. Yeah. Uh, could, like, you want me to be honest? Yeah, bring it, man. Cocaine. Um, acid, um, ecstasy, I, you know, I, in my mind, I felt that if I was going to do two hits of ecstasy and do that gram of cocaine, of course I need to take 10 vitamin B12 pills because it's my body working together. Um, you know, you gotta be in balance, man. You gotta be in balance, right? You have to know that as you are getting those blisters in your mouth from the crystal meth, that 
and you're of course sneaking out of the house that you grew up in and you should have and you had fake IDs. Yeah, I, I did everything and anything. Um, here's what I knew that there was a problem. Um, I was, um, you know, I quit cocaine at one moment. I went out and do it again. And I'm grateful for that. But, you know, one turns into another. So I couldn't get enough vodka in me. Um, from the get-go, I was never happy. In my mind, I wanted to die. And here's the thing. I'm, I don't want to die. I just wanted the voices to stop. Like, I, I just wanted the voices to stop. I wanted this emotion. Like, here's here's... My parents did the best they could. They were immigrants in this country. My mom was 19, my dad was 23. I was, my mom was 23 when I was born, my dad was 27. So they were just kids having kids, you know? And the conversation, as you know, being a parent now is very different than when your parents were parents. Um, so I just, um, I wasn't happy and I didn't have that much self-esteem. So the more I numbed it all, the better off I was. Yeah. Um, we were brought up to be respectful, perfect children. And, you know, when we were growing up, you were seen, you weren't heard. We were the perfect family. Totally, totally man. Family. And did totally. you grow up in LA? Where did you grow I up? Did. With that? Well, that's that's, that's, that's well, to be very uncharacteristic. Like that's more like Nebraska or Omaha or Heartland type of values. That's really, oh, no, we it were, must be the immigrant thing then. It was, you know, you don't, we, we would win contests on airplanes as being like the perfect family. Yeah. And, you know, I used to call, you know, and then once the door closes, the secrets come out and the, the, the truth comes out. And, you know, I believe both parents are qualifiers. I believe like my mom, my mom died at 58. She died from esophageal cancer. She to this day, I can't smell vodka and orange juice. That was her drink of choice. You know, so it's what I knew. It's what I saw. It's when social drinking did her, you know, it's, it's, my mom was an alcoholic. She died an alcoholic. Um, um, I knew that there was a problem when I was shitting and throwing up blood. Yeah, that's I, kind of a problem. I knew that when people were talking about me showing up so drunk from the night before that I wasn't working or going to auditions because I was sweating so much that there was a problem. I knew that when my twin and I would go out to drink and hang out with friends that I don't remember driving home. I knew that getting in trouble with the law, there was a problem. Yeah. Three times. I knew that were you already were you you were already an actor at this time because you started so young too? Was that was that during? Yeah, it was I yeah I was arrested uh, during um, yeah like like my last big arrest was a five oh two. You know I got arrested for cocaine addiction. Mm -hmm. um, it was arrested for um, embezzlement. Mm. Like I like you know and, and as I'm sitting, my father's son like I hear him say Gregory as he's in heaven. And here's the deal. I just, I did whatever I could to get what I needed. And yeah. I didn't care who I hurt. And, you know, Mayor Sun arrested for a DUI. You know, like, it wasn't me. It was like Mayor Sun. And of course, at that time, my best thinking was to blame my dad and go, you didn't love me. It's your fault. Mom did this. You know, blame the whole world. Because when you're an addict, of course, it's not your fault. It's everybody else's fault. Um, Here's what, here's what I will say is I was in a, another program. I was in Al-Anon for years before my mom passed away. And I was pissed at God for taking my mom. So I was angry and I had stayed in contact with my sponsor and a family member had gone to rehab and I was supposed to go see them in rehab. And I was so drunk from the night before that I didn't want to cancel going to this AA meeting. Ellen, this is this AA meeting. And um, I was going to call the sponsor. And I was so embarrassed of being sung home, hung over so much 
that I just had to suck it up and I went to my first meeting. And it was at the Virgin Megastore here in Los Angeles. Saw the meeting and I was still whirling from being drunk. Um, that I was in the parking lot, I fell to my knees and I sobbed and I lost it. And I said, did you ever know that there was a problem? And she said, every time you called me, you were hungover or drunk. And 15 years later, like I didn't go to rehab. Um, you, didn't, I, you didn't go to rehab? Oh, I um, called it street sobriety, called my, my, my rehabilitation center life and street. So you just um, detox cold, like cold turkey is what you did? I did. Wow. You know, I didn't Did you recommend that for some, I mean, I, I don't, not that you're a doctor, but like, if you knew a friend, like if you, it's, kind of, it's kind of a stupid question, I think maybe too. I, I don't know. Not a stupid question. I think, I think if you, if you have an opportunity to go to yeah. a rehabilitation facility with experts there, yeah. absolutely. You know, I don't, a friend of mine went last year and to this day, there's things that she brings up to me that she learned in rehab that I was like, wow, tell me that again. Like I want to, you know, she broke down all of it. I, I went, you know, my sobriety is the most personal, private, raw thing I've ever done. You know, speaking in a meeting, speaking to you, like I, yeah, sweating. Why would you do this, by the way? Because not everybody does this. Why? Why would you do this? I mean, it's not necessarily like a big feather in, in a career cap, you know, like save my life. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to die today. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was born with an addiction. I didn't ask for it. You know, I didn't ask to be a twin. It's just, you yeah. know, for me, I, I believe we all have an allergy. Mine was just bigger. You know, do I wish I could have a martini and put it down and not have another one for a month? I do, but I'm not that person. You know, I, I am, I, I am grateful that I walked into a bar, not a bar, a liquor store, and I walked in and I looked at the guy and I said, and he showed me a liter of vodka and a pack of Marlboro Lights. And I said, how would you know? And he goes, uh, you're here every day. And I went, wow, the fact that nothing physically has happened to me. And here's, here's what i think the of fact that you didn't realize that really no. as well like how would you know that that's pretty amazing uh because i was there every day You're right. <laughs> no there was my very first meetings the guy was sharing and he said that he came home one day in his britain his rock rock bottom is this he drove home one day drunk and he broke into his driveway and he was trashed and he parked wrong and he threw his car into reverse and he went ah oh, shit i drove over my kid's bike he killed his son. Wow, God, man. You're a dad. The fact that I didn't kill anybody. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, so why would I do this? Because I want to be a service. Yeah. You it's know, that there's, one person. you know, it, it's a God of our choosing. It's, it's, I've had, I have the best relationship with God and it's my God. It's, it's my choice. It's, and Here's what, what, role, what role does faith play in your sobriety? Everything. And here's the beautiful part of all of it. I don't, you know, as you were saying earlier about God and, you know, Christianity and, you know, God loves you today. I've worked with some really amazing people. And there's a show, a, series, a production company I work with called Try Destin. And they have hired me a lot. And one of the producers, her name is Dr. Lana. She is this amazing woman. And we talk all the time about faith. And she just reminds me often, because I believe we all, sometimes our faith is like this and sometimes our faith is like that. And it's this reminder. And I will call her and I'll say, how are you, doc? And she'll be, I'm highly favored. I'm yeah, highly I love that. I have friends that say I'm blessed and highly favored. I answer the phone. How are you doing today? I'm blessed and highly favored. Highly favored, and she's the best hugger. And we talk about God, and yeah, it's it's like you and me, my faith. You know, yeah. you it's the God shot. You and I are talking about God. I don't, yeah. I don't know what your God looks like, but I believe he's a pretty good I, guy. You know, he actually, I will tell you, I, I have a little secret. I will tell you like that. So not, like I said, I'm a, I'm a Christian. There's a verse in the Bible I love. It says that we were created in God's image and his likeness. So if you want to know what your, what your God, what my God looks like, he actually looks like me. 
the same way that you would tell, you look at my kids by their mannerisms, by how they talk, by how they look, you go, yeah, that's Rob's kids. That's what God, that's, he looks at, so God looks like you. He looks like me. He looks like, we're created in his image and his likeness. When you go, no, those are his kids. That's I love everything about that. I don't, you know, a beautiful line from the Broadway show, Lay Miz, to love one another is to see the face of God. Mm-hmm. It is, oh, I like that. That's great. Uh, I believe that when I pray in the morning and at night that I am praying. And I believe that we are all in this circle praying. Yeah. I believe oh, cool. that the way we pray is rather different. We are praying to the same house, whatever that looks like. We are just going down different streets. It's a God yeah. of my choosing. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, when you when you notice when somebody needs somebody or you are in dire need, you are on your knees saying, dear God, dear God, dear God. That's right. Same gesture, please, please. In humility, in, in hope, in, in, in grace. Um, you know, so here's what I say to people that ask me about what it's like to, it's the best ticket in town. It's given me more things than I can even imagine. And one thing that it's allowed me to do is not be afraid to tell you or anybody else my story. We all have a story. Yep. It has opened my ears. I've never heard one thing in a meeting or in a room and be like, oh my God, I've never heard that. I've, it's more like, oh, I've heard that. And you then empathize with what that story is. We all have a story and we all have a room to say, this is what this is today for me. And you are giving your story to somebody else to let them know that there is a reprieve on the other hand, on the other side of it. On the other side of it, yeah. The purpose of life is to give confidence to others. To quote Absolutely. that, that uh, my brother told me one time, I said, well, why are we here to give confidence to others? You're gonna, your story is gonna connect with somebody. And they're gonna go, holy shit, like that's my story or God, that's worse or damn, if he can do it, I love that. I have to do a little plug for this, a semi plug for it, but like, tell me about, I watched the trailer, um, 86 Melrose, like it was kick ass, man. I, I liked all of it, um, all of the stuff I uh, saw. So tell me a little bit about that because at the time this comes out, that should be right around or maybe t- still a little bit of TBD, but it, I love the trailer. Near the, near the end of the year. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to say this too. Uh, the only reason I'm doing what we're doing now is if there's somebody out there that is suffering from any type of addiction, they're not alone. And the beautiful part about the internet is you can go to any 12 step program, any recovery program, food, sex, drugs, alcohol, anything. You can find it on the internet and reach out to somebody. And there are people 24 seven, even if people suck suffering, from their sexuality, we're not alone. And if I can help Anything. one person, then I've done a fucking great job because somebody helped me. Um, here's what's, you know, we talked about it in the very beginning about mental illness. And I believe that, you know, I believe that we all spend a lot of time in our minds. I believe we tell each other stories that are, you know, facts are not truth. I mean, yeah, um, feelings are not facts. Um, Facts for me are things that happened. What we what happens from that is what we tell ourselves and what we actually see. The beautiful thing of 86 Melrose Avenue, it was written by Lily Mata. Um, I worked with her before a couple of years ago, and it's people that are held up in an art gallery from a man that is suffering from PTSD. Um, he was in the war, and he is unhinged from something that happens. I don't want to give anything away. Yeah. But here's what's beautiful about this movie, and I believe that we have these opportunities all the time, is we become face-to-face with our past and what happens. My character addresses what happened to him as a kid. And here's what happened. What do you do with it? Who do you become from it? What's the story you tell from it? And we are all, us hostages, as I are held at gunpoint and we are met to meet our maker and deal with our God and have our, make peace with what's happened. Mm -hmm. And it 
you know, especially with where we are in the world now and with what we're talking about, it's, it deals with PTSD. It deals with what my character's mental illness is. It deals with a woman that has a stutter. It deals with a gentleman that is dealing with a sexuality, a father, and a woman that um, is hypoglycemic. It deals with all of that, and it's about what do we do with it. So it's, um, and it's, it's, I think it's shot beautifully. It's some of the most raw work I've ever done. And um, it also deals with, especially with where we are in the world, it deals with religion and race. So it's, um, you know, just because somebody is black or white, why should it matter? And the conversation is, is as a world, we've made color matter. We've made, you know, I believe that, you know, if I am on my knees going like this, or if I'm on my knees going like this, or if I'm on my knees going like this, I'm still giving it over to a God. Yeah. God is my choosing. So it's, it's a lot of everything. And um, when you walk out of the movie, you'll want to, you will want to finish the things that are undone in your life because life is really short and you will want to become complete with things that are not done. So I'm really? very proud of it. Yeah. It it looked great, and um, uh, you know, it looked like definitely like something that I, that I would want to see. And um, I, I, you know, I was glad. come down to the premiere. Yeah, I, I'm inviting you now. Maybe so. You know, very possible. Um, we're gonna put it. We're gonna actually put at least the trailer in this feature because the way the recovery today is, we're a multimedia um, uh, magazine, so we can put this along with the interview with the trailer in here. So make sure you click on and watch it, and then find out where it's at. I'll probably find out where, how it's going to be, if it's gonna, if it's a direct or, or or what. We'll we'll include all that as well. And um, can I throw can I throw one thing out there to you? Yeah. It's a plug. I know we you and I wanted to talk a lot about Westworld, but the Emmy nomination is for a love story. It's for a series called Venice the Series, and it's just six seasons of a love story. And I am so proud to be part of that love story. I'm in two seasons, and it's you know we all fall in love and how we get to be with the one or ones, I believe that we all get to have soul mates. Um, it's a journey and it is such a wonderful journey. And if any of you are fans of One Life to Live, Guiding Light, Days of Our Lives, General Hospital, there are many of your favorite soap opera actors on this show that tell a beautiful love story. Cool. It doesn't have to be gay, straight, this or that. It's just Love is love, and yeah. you love who you love, and um, I'm really proud of that. So thank you for letting me get the plug. For it's that. been a uh, absolutely. It's been a real pleasure to uh, to get to know you. Um, it's been a real pleasure to um, kind of have a conversation, and um, you know I, I think we need you know more people like you in the in that in the world. People that have this kind of values. I really appreciate kind of the conversation about you know value and service to other people being a gentleman covered a lot of stuff that we haven't really i've never really talked about much before but um thank you for taking the time to, to jump my on. pleasure thank can you. i ask you one question before sure. we wrap out yeah. why do you do what you do why is this platform important for you yeah this is that's a great question and thank you for asking it as well um this is it's really it's therapy for me and um it makes me feel good uh to be honest um uh, we have a need to know one another and to be known. And um, it, I, it also, it's also part of the whole, like it, it, uh, everything that happened to you, it gives meaning to everything that happened to you. So it gives me an outlet to kind of tell my story, to bounce back and forth, to have a volley like this. And then it, you know, ultimately it releases dopamine in my brain, man. I feel good doing it. And you and I are hugging right now in my life. Right, man. There you go. And I get to make, and the thing that's cool too is I get to make new friends. I, I you know, I, I, I don't, I get to make new friends. I get to make, make You're coming make, down make, to the premiere of 86 Melrose Avenue. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. No, like it's like, it's like, it's done. All right. Like I'll look at my twin brother and my partner and be like, sorry, I, he's with me. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, thank you again. I uh, appreciate it. It was great. I hope everybody else, I know that other people are going to get nice little if nuggets. If somebody needs me, please, seriously, if somebody needs me, please find me. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. How can they find you? I, thank at you. at uh, website, gregoryzarian.com. Everything is at Gregory Zarian. And then, you know, one thing that I want to throw out there and you can please. address to is to pause. 
you know, for all of us, if we are in a place and we are struggling politically, emotionally, mentally, if, you know, families are in the same house 24 seven now, yeah. you know, take a walk, pause, stop before you say something. And, you know, uh, the serenity prayer, super simple. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's just about stopping this, getting into that, and it slowly takes you out of the manic panic. And, um, and be kind to yourself, you know, drink water, get some sleep, take time for yourself, walk around the block, and um, just be kind to you. Because if you're kind to you, you can be kind to somebody else. And we will get through this as, as we've gotten through everything before. Everything before. It's Very something. obvious to see how you're a lifestyle expert, man. A uh, lot, a lot of pearls of wisdom there. Wait, does that? Oh, hold on. You probably then want to see what the outfit is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My twin brother. Yeah, my twin brother would be. I have to. He would be. And here, look. I'm going to throw in some rock, some runway. Krista, LA models. <laughs> this is why I made the big box. Nice, man. Nailed it. <laughs> nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Nice. Thank you. Good stuff. All right, Thank everybody. This has friend. been another great, fun, exclusive, cool interview by Recovery Today. Gregory Zarian, thank you so much. And you. this is a wrap. <laughs>